Hey class, happy whatever day it is today. This is the introductory chapter to research methods, and I want to ask, well, usually I would ask the class, but if you responded, I wouldn't be able to hear you. <laughs> oh, we have fun. But the first thing that we usually talk about is why are we learning about research methods? What are research methods? So when you're doing research, you're doing it because you want to understand a specific phenomenon, right? You're trying to get more information about something. So if you're doing a survey, perhaps, maybe you want to know uh, how many people in your class are uh, vegetarian or vegan or have allergies so that you can put together a uh, you know, uh, I don't know, what a potluck for the class. Or maybe uh, you're trying to plan for a talent show and you want to see how many people would be interested, right? And then on a scale of 1 to 10, how interested they would be. How you ask those questions and how you deserve, uh, design sorry, that survey is going to affect the quality of data that you get, right? So uh, when we're designing research, we need to make sure that we're designing it in the best possible way to get the best possible results. And in taking this class, we can also understand other people's research in order to make sure that we can critically evaluate that research and that source of information and see whether or not uh, we should take it seriously, right? So just because somebody has studied something doesn't necessarily mean that their conclusions are correct, right? Just because something that you read agrees with how you feel doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. Uh, so we're going to be learning how to evaluate information and to evaluate our own knowledge. So let's talk about the scientific approach. One, data plays a central role, right? We don't just get to go, well, this is the way that I feel, or this is the way that I've always believed, and go, well, that. It must be true because I've already believed it, uh, even though I have no data to back it up, right? You need to have data, and that data should be quality, right? There's a difference between me saying, uh, I uh, know one person who went to this school and they hated it, so uh, I think it's a bad school, versus I surveyed a thousand students at this school and all thousand of them who are current students at the school hate it, right? There's a difference in the quality because one is just relying on anecdotal evidence, one person. Once I involve more people, it's becoming a representative survey. So you really want to make sure you have good data. Also, scientists are not alone right? Scientists rely on the work that other people are doing. So it's not just one person ignoring everything else that's ever been done, coming to their own conclusions. They're taking into consideration things that other people have found, right? And sometimes the things that other people find are going to contradict what they find, or it can support what they find, which leads us to our next idea. Science is adversarial. Uh, uh, adversity, like conflict, right? Sometimes you're going to find things that don't uh, really match what you believed before. The point of science isn't just to agree with anything that other people have said, right? Just because I find that, I don't know, uh, in the study, people who ate chocolate uh, are less likely to uh, develop cancer. Just because I found that doesn't mean that we're done, right? The next person who's researching that has to go, okay, well, how could this person have messed up? Is there some 
something specific to that research study that could be wrong. So instead of trying to pat each other on the back and say, well, you figured out this thing, we're done, we're always trying to see if we've made a mistake or if other people might have made a mistake, not in a mean way, just to make sure that we're getting the best information. If we just assume that everyone else is correct, right, then the work is done. We don't have to study things more. But the more we study things, the more we go, okay, well, in this specific case, that doesn't happen to be true. And so we start studying that specific case and then we learn about other things. The last thing is scientific evidence is peer reviewed. Nothing is published in a scientific journal without at least two people who have been published in that journal before, who are familiar with doing research, have read over it and given the methodologies approval, right? So if uh, my research study is, um, do uh, cats really love human beings? And then I just write a story about like how sometimes my cat, you know, will like sleep next to me uh, and how uh, he'll do cute things and how I taught it how to high five, right? That's not a scientific journal. There's a lot of my own personal bias, right? Now, if I spent, you know, three years researching, uh, you know, uh, big cats, like, you know, lions and tigers, uh, and doing research on uh, the ev evolutionary history uh, of cats and how they became domesticated and looking at how cats show affection in the wild and comparing that to how a cat might show affection in a household, uh, that, right, that's got a little bit more credence to it. So somebody looking at the first study might go, well, this isn't well designed, right? There are a lot of assumptions that are being made. Somebody looking at the second study might go, okay, there's a lot of methodology, there's some logic to this. I think this might be good for our journal. So anything that is studied, right, is going to have to meet that threshold for peer review. So really, we're making sure that the knowledge that we get into the field is good, right? Uh, it meets some threshold for quality, but once it's there, we don't just let it be we continue trying to see if we've made some mistake or if we've misunderstood something. So we're continually trying to disprove ourselves. Some people consider this a weakness of science, right? Uh, if you look at the um, COVID-19 uh, crisis where, you know, at the beginning, we thought one thing uh, and we were saying, you know, don't buy these types of masks. And then, uh, oh, actually, you can wear these types of masks. Oh, these types of masks aren't uh, effective, right? A lot of people were saying, well, uh, you can't trust scientists because they say one thing and then later they say something completely different. I would argue that that is the reason why you should trust scientists because they give advice based off of the information that they understand. And then when they get new information that contradicts what they've already said, they don't go, well, I already said it, so I don't wanna change my mind. They go, okay, it looks like we misunderstood something. Based off of what we understand now, this is the evidence that, uh, or this is the advice that we're going to give, right? So. Imagine you went to a doctor and you're like, hey, I have, I think I have a cold. And then they're like, yeah, we think that you have a cold. And then suddenly the next day uh, you're coughing off blood uh, and, you know, you're uh, having trouble uh, breathing uh, and uh, you go uh, like blind. And then the doctor is like, well, I already said it was a cold. So just, you know, get some water and you'll be fine. No, hopefully your doctor says, Based off of this new information, I realized that we were wrong, and now let's make a new hypothesis, right? You want to be open to new information. So we can't talk about science without talking about pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is stuff that seems scientific, but really isn't. Uh, when we see uh, pseudo, 
that's referring to fake. So it's fake science. And it's very easy to be fooled by pseudoscience. A lot of the things that we take for granted are actually pseudoscientific. But what ends up happening is we don't want to change our beliefs because we're like, well, I've been doing this this entire time, right? But we should. We should change our beliefs when we get new information. So one uh, thing with pseudoscience is that claims are untestable, so they cannot be refuted, right? So let's say I am trying to get you on this uh, new exercise, right? It's a very spiritual exercise. Uh, and I say, uh, there are uh, uh, microcosms uh, uh, in your bloodstream. Now, uh, you most people can't sense them, but uh, these uh, microcosms uh, that exist in your blood cause all the negative symptoms that you experience. Stress, oops, sorry, uh, depression. Uh, I'm just like destroying my desk. Uh, you know, uh, impotence, whatever, uh, are caused by these little microcosms in your bloodstream. Now, scientific uh, tools can't sense this energy, right? Uh, but I am aware that they exist in your bloodstream. So pay me $1,000 a month to get them out of your bloodstream. Uh, and then I promise you, you'll feel so much better. Now, some of you guys are going, sign me up. Others of you are maybe going, wait a second, but how do I know that they're gone? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that they're gone. I'll be like, oh, wow, you had a lot this month, right? Uh, look at all these microcosms that uh, were removed from your bloodstream. Uh, now, not being able to test it means that I cannot disprove it. How can I prove whether or not they were removed if the only thing that I can trust is a person who's removing them, right? Uh, in the same way, sometimes you hear about like detoxing, right? Uh, and you might hear about like, ooh, all these toxins that are stuck in your body and you have to get them out. Which ones? Which toxins? Like specifically, which toxins? And how do you measure the level of toxins in your body beforehand and after, right? So for example, sometimes people might go on a detox after drinking a whole bunch of alcohol because they're like, oh, I put so much alcohol in my body. Now, two days later, you know, I still need, I need to get all that alcohol out. The alcohol is out of your body already. It's already been processed by, just so you guys know, you have a liver and it does that. That's the whole purpose of it. Uh, the whole purpose of our liver is so that we can drink alcohol. Uh, but the, uh, so if I say something vague like toxins, toxins sounds bad, right? You hear toxins and you're like, I don't want that in my body, right? But you know what? Water in excess could be a toxin, right? So uh, as soon as you pee, you've already detoxified your body. Mwah, you're welcome. I just saved you hundreds of dollars. So uh, saying something vague, right, uh, would be the next thing. Uh, so imprecise, biased, or vague language. If I just say that I'm getting rid of toxins, but I don't specify what's being gotten rid of, right, uh, then, you know, that's, that's not, how am I supposed to measure that? Uh, in addition, our bodies are going to have things that shouldn't be in there uh, all the time. Uh, and that is just a thing that we do. We just put stuff in our bodies that shouldn't be in there, even if we try very hard not to. And our bodies, for the most part, can tolerate stuff, right? Uh, so just because there's something, quote unquote, bad in our body doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cause us any harm, right? Most of the time, we put bad things in our body on purpose because uh, we want some of that harm, right? Why do we purposely eat very spicy food? It basically tells our brain that we're in pain and we're like, mmm, spicier, right? So uh, just because something is a toxin doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to kill us and we need to get it out of our bodies eventually. And most things will get out of our bodies eventually, right? So we want to be, care be careful of imprecise, biased, or vague language. We also see a lot of evidence based off of anecdotes or testimonials, 
So uh, we rely on this kind of automatically, right? You're on uh, Amazon and you're like, oh, I'm going to buy this thing. And then you see like a whole bunch of five-star reviews and then you see one one-star review where you're like, uh, I bought this, uh, you know, um, <laughs> set of uh, plastic cups. Uh, but uh, when they arrived, there were scorpions in the cups uh, and the scorpions stung me to death. Uh, and now I'm writing from the grave, right? And you're like, well, I don't want scorpions to sting me to death. Uh, I'm not going to order these cups, right? Now, uh, but also we are like, oh, uh, you know, uh, I bought these cups and then I met the love of my life and now uh, I'm married. And they're like, oh, I want to get married. I want to meet the love of my life, right? So we rely on anecdotes and testimonials, but we can't always trust them, right? Uh, we can't always trust the source of the information. So uh, we see this a lot with, you know, um, uh, diet pills and things like that. Uh, sometimes people lose weight. Uh, also, sometimes people uh, in these weight loss programs are in very controlled situations, right? So in addition to taking this pill, they're also exercising uh, multiple times a day and restricting caloric intake. Uh, so the before and after pics that you see aren't just related to the uh, pill that they're taking or whatever process. Uh, it's related to other things that they're doing that they don't tell you about. But you see that uh, before and after picture and like, oh, that's going to work for me for sure. Right? So we want to be careful uh, of relying on anecdotes and testimonies. Same thing with like the cold. Everybody has their thing that they do to get over the cold. I'm going to spoil the cold for you. Uh, most people will not die from the cold. Uh, and if you won't die from it, that means that eventually your immune system will fight it. Right? If your immune system will fight it, then that means that no matter what you do, you'll always get over the cold. So if you do nothing, you'll get better, right? So me like loading up on vitamin C and zinc or taking airborne or drinking like five gallons of water a day or uh, drinking like hot tea with like whiskey in it, uh, some of those things will make me feel better, right? Uh, if I have a sore throat, it might soothe it. Uh, if I'm, you know, feeling uh, tired, uh, some chicken soup might give me energy, right? They might soothe the symptoms, but they don't actually get rid of the virus, right? The virus will fight, get uh, out of your system eventually because of your immune system, which for most of us is working properly. If you're immunocompromised, it's a little bit different. So somebody going like, oh yeah, whenever I'm sick, I do this and then I automatically feel better and then I'm not sick anymore. Well, how do we know that it actually works? Or is it just them believing that it works and then feeling better? And also sometimes what you do if you want something to work is you'll ignore any symptoms that you have. So it's like you'll, you'll have coughed 12 times that day and then you'll be like, oh, I only coughed 12 times a day, right? So I'm not that sick. But if you thought that you were sick, you'd be like, I cough 12 times a day. Uh, oh, man, I must be really sick, right? So uh, we're uh, anecdotal evidence is problematic because people uh, are going to tell you what they want to believe. Uh, the other issue with so, uh, pseudoscience is uh, the reliance on uh, quote-unquote experts, right? Uh, so just because somebody uh, is a doctor uh doesn't mean that you have to trust them uh and it's just like because sometimes what ends up happening is like somebody will be like i'm a doctor of history uh and i say uh that the only way to cure a cold is by injecting bleach into your bloodstream and then people go that person's a doctor uh there's also this very weird thing that we've been doing in society recently where people uh like want to believe doctors who have been like shunned by the medical community right so like it's it's very frustrating because there's a reason why they were shunned by the medical community because they're saying things that like are not true right and are sometimes dangerous uh i know one of you is like uh oh they got professor thompson he's a corporate shill uh he's a sheeple right 
Uh, I'm not a shill. I'm not a sheeple. Uh, but uh, if somebody uh, loses their license, uh, then you should probably not trust them, right? If your Lyft driver or Uber driver lost their driver's license, you wouldn't be like, oh, I definitely need to get them as my driver uh, because uh, those big corporate wigs are trying to, you know, uh, shun my driver from, uh, you know, they have the real truth, right? Uh, so we, there's this new like trend where we want to trust people who are quote unquote doctors, uh, but are like, oh, I have the real truth, right? Uh, no, we probably shouldn't trust people whose opinions uh, go like uh, strongly against what the majority of people who study this uh, and practice this for a living believe. That's my humble opinion, right? Uh, so we have to be careful about where the evidence comes from. Uh, also, sometimes these people ignore conflicting evidence, right? Uh, so it's like uh, with hydroxychloroquine, uh, there were lots of studies that showed that it wasn't better than placebo, uh, that it was actually more harmful for people, uh, that there were times in studies where people died. Uh, so there, are, uh, there were a few studies that showed that it was helpful. There were a lot of studies that showed that it wasn't. But people were saying, well, look at these studies that show that it's helpful. And the scientific community is going, yeah, but like, look at these studies that show that it's not helpful, right? Uh, so you can't just focus on the stuff that proves what you believe. You have to take all of the information into consideration. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, uh, references to scientific evidence lack information on the methods that would allow independent verification. Uh, so uh, not telling people how I did my study uh, means that it makes it harder to evaluate if I did my study well or not. So if I said I did a survey and uh, you know 100% of uh, people in the survey said that they were voting for a certain person in the presidential election, you would want to know how many people I ask and where I found these people. There's going to be a difference between me asking a whole bunch of people in a retiree home in Arkansas versus a whole bunch of college students in Berkeley, right? Uh, there's going to be a difference between asking 10,000 people versus 10 people. So not uh, so hiding the methods uh, and not reporting how the study was done is another way uh, to show that something is pseudoscientific. So by understanding what you shouldn't do, it will make it easier to understand what you should do. And then when you see studies that do these things, you can go, well, I'm going to take this information with a healthy dose of skepticism and not just accept it at face value. So let's talk about the goals of behavioral science. They are to describe, predict, and determine the causes of behavior, right? Uh, so describing is basically going, this is what's happening, right? When I give people this drug, uh, then I'm seeing these side effects. The prediction is going, okay, well, do I think that I'm going to see these side effects every time I give somebody this drug? If so, then... If I need, so let's say um, I had a client who was feeling very stressed, right? Uh, maybe um, I'm a dentist uh, and I have people uh, in my uh, office that are feeling very stressed. Uh, and I need them to kind of like sit uh, in their chair uh, and relax while I do some work. Uh, maybe they'll space out and watch TV. And then I see that uh, there are these, you know, gummy bears that are being sold that have a specific chemical in them that makes people kind of relax, uh, kind of tune out, and sometimes they'll just focus uh, on what's on TV and watch it without really thinking about what's going on in the world. And I go, maybe I should get some of these gummies uh, to my patients. And then I go, oh, if I have a client who's stressed, I can give them this thing and I'm going to have that effect, right? So we're predicting what's going to happen if we do a specific thing. 
And then we want to determine the causes of behavior, right? Uh, so why is it that this gummy does this specific thing? Well, there's a chemical in it called uh, THC, and THC uh, binds to the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. Uh, the cannabinoid, re cannabinoid receptors in the brain are responsible to, for this specific thing, uh, so that binding process creates this specific effect. So we're describing, we're predicting, and then we're understanding what the causes are. So one thing that we'll continue talking about in this class is causation. You may have heard this phrase before, but if you haven't, or even if you have, write it down. It's going to come up a lot. Correlation does not imply causation. Correlation, so the relationship between two things, does not imply causation, right? So uh, today, uh, I decided to get a haircut, right? Now, uh, later tonight, I get a text from my girlfriend of three years uh, that she's breaking up with me. <sighs> Obviously, she broke up with me because of the haircut, right? Oh, I shouldn't have gotten that haircut. If I didn't get that haircut, I would have still been in my healthy, slightly toxic relationship, right? No, not right. Uh, just because two things are related does not mean that one thing caused the other thing, right? We assume that because two things happen around the same time that one thing might cause the other thing, but we can't because sometimes what happens is two random things just happen at the same time or one thing causes another thing, uh, which causes that third thing or the direction uh, that we assume that correlate or that causation to be is wrong. So the reason I wanted to get a haircut is because I knew that my relationship was ending. Uh, so subconsciously, I was like, I should, you know, look nice again because I'm going to be taking photos to put on dating apps. So uh, the reason why I got the haircut is because I was going to be broken up with I, the haircut didn't create the situation in which I got broken up with, right? Uh, so there are three things that you want to be aware of when it comes to determining causation, whether or not one thing caused another thing. One is what's called temporal precedence. Uh, temporal refers to time. Precedence means one thing comes before the other, right? Preceding. Uh, so in order for thing one to uh, cause thing two, right, thing one should have happened first. So this would be temporal precedence, right? Uh, thing one has to come before the second thing. Then there's covariation of cause and effect. Uh, so uh, when we're talking about uh, two things that are related, right, the more you do one thing, that should cause a change in the other thing. So let's say I'm at a party, right? And I don't drink at all. How drunk should I get? Probably not drunk at all, right? If I'm not drinking, I shouldn't get drunk. Now, if I have one or two drinks, maybe I'll get a little bit buzzed, maybe I'll get a little bit tipsy, right? Uh, if I have five, seven drinks, then I might get a little slammered, right? Uh, if I have 10, 12 drinks, uh, I might get alcohol poisoning. Uh, so uh, the more I drink, the more intoxicated I become. The less I drink, the less intoxicated I become, right? So there's covariation of cause and effect. Uh, I'm actually recording this uh, during a very hot period of time uh it is what what's the temperature oh it's actually not too bad right now uh it's just 80 uh but the past couple weeks have been real hot uh so uh i sometimes forget to hydrate right uh so that once again the less water i drink the more dehydrated i become uh, i start to drink more water i feel better i drink less water i feel worse so those two things are related. And then finally, 
uh, in order to determine causation, we want to eliminate uh, third variables. We want to eliminate uh, alternative explanations. So uh, let's say I'm, uh, um, uh, I'm wondering why I'm single, right? Uh, so the, um, so I might say, oh, the reason why I'm single is because nobody wants to date a professor, right? It's just not, it's just not a sexy profession. Guys, if you want to have a sexy profession, don't be a professor. I'm telling you right now, uh, the, uh, and everyone's just like, oh, Professor Thompson, I'm so sorry that you're sad and single. And it's like, oh, I'll survive. Uh, I got video games. Uh, so the, uh, so I might assume that, uh, the reason why I'm single is because I'm a professor, right? Uh, now it's actually not because I'm a professor. There are other things that are related to that, that make me, uh, undateable. So one, I'm kind of a know-it-all, right? Uh, because I'm so used uh, to, uh, like, uh, correcting other people. Uh, when you're on a date with me, uh, I'm a very nitpicky, right? Uh, on your text, uh, you'll use the wrong your, and I'll be like, asterisk your, right? Uh, so I'm kind of like a know-it-all. Also, because I'm a professor, I'm used to talking a lot. Uh, so on a first date with me, you cannot get me to shut up right? Uh, so uh, the other thing is, I'm just kind of arrogant. Like, I'm just kind of a mean person. Uh, the, the, these aren't true. I'm actually very popular on uh, the dating apps. Uh, I've matched with two people this quarantine, two whole people. Yeah. They haven't responded to my message yet, but um, I'm going to just give it time. Play it cool. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the I'm assuming that the thing is uh, because I'm a professor, but it's actually because I'm a terrible person, right? Uh, so I'm arrogant, I'm a know-it-all, I talk too much and I don't really listen. Uh, so uh, you want to eliminate potential third variables uh, when you're studying causation. So now let's talk about hypotheses and theories, right? When you start doing research, usually you're starting with some sort of research question, some general idea that you want to understand. So I kind of want to know if there's a relationship between being a nice professor uh, and uh, students' success in a class, right? Does that doesn't matter if you are nice or mean or funny or not, right? Uh, so do personality traits have a relationship to student success, right? Then uh, I might take that general topic and I might narrow it down a little bit. So uh, do funny teachers teach better than non-funny teachers? Uh, then I take that hypothesis and I turn it into a prediction, right? And then I say, I believe that we will find in this study that uh, funnier teachers have better student outcomes than teachers who are not funny. And then finally, uh, whatever data that I get, so maybe in this uh, study with 60 people, I find that uh, professors who are funnier uh, get better student outcomes than students who don't, which is great for me. Uh, the, uh, yay, employment. Uh, so uh, I might find that, but then I'm going to add that information into our general understanding of theory, right? Uh, so we have other studies that have looked at the relationship between professor humor and student outcomes. Maybe we've looked at uh, openness or introversion, right? Do introverted professors teach uh, just as well as extroverted uh, professors? And we might find that there are some personality traits that are helpful and some personality traits and some behavior uh, behaviors that are not, right? Uh, so that's our theory. And it's constantly molding as we get new information, right? Maybe certain types of humor are better. So if I'm a teacher who uh, is doing uh, puns all the time, maybe students do worse. Uh, 
Uh, if I do uh, like funny observations, maybe students do better. If I'm the type of person who puts, uh, who puts like memes uh, in my, uh, you know, uh, presentation, like a, this is me uh, making a, a doge. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, so teach. Uh, I don't know how to draw dogs. Uh, so that's just like a weird bird, I guess. Uh, so uh, forgive me for not knowing how to draw dogs psychology teacher not a not an art teacher uh if you wanted real good drawings of uh shiba inus uh then you go to a, a dog drawing class get out of here uh so uh the theory is that systematic uh uh kind of it's not like a book that you open up and you read but it's kind of uh the idea that all this knowledge that we have uh kind of exists right uh so yeah uh, so we have research question, we boil that down to a hypothesis, we make a prediction, we get data, and that data contributes to our theoretical understanding of a thing, which then will lead to another research question and hypothesis. So there are different types of research papers. Uh, we'll talk about just a few of them for right now. Uh, but you have literature reviews, uh, you have meta-analyses, and you have empirical research articles. Literature reviews are great because, as I mentioned, we have lots of articles that are talking about a specific topic, right? And they contribute to theory. What a literature review does is it can take 10, 20, 30 different studies and say, this is everything uh, that in the past five years has been written about related to uh, professor personality and student outcomes, right? Uh, these talks about uh, extra. These three talk about extroversion and introversion. These five talk about humor. Uh, these four talk about like openness and generosity. Uh, these five talk about uh, patience, whatever, whatever, right? Uh, so by summarizing all those in one paper, it makes it very easy to, at a glance, understand where we are and what else needs to be studied. And many literature reviews will at the end say, these things haven't been fully explored, and this is a, these are some suggestions for future research. Uh, so literature reviews give us a nice summary of things. Meta-analyses take it one step further, and what they do is they take all these different studies that have been done and pull them together and basically treat them as one big study. Uh, so they use statistical techniques to take all the data from these different studies and just treat them as one big study. So instead of having a you know sample size of 30, you have maybe a sample size of 300, uh, which is going to give you more information on the strength of a specific phenomena. Uh, and then finally, we have empirical research articles, which are original research studies. And those are the ones that are going into literature reviews and meta-analyses. So basically what they're doing is they're, uh, that's what we were just talking about, where you form your own hypothesis, you make a prediction, and then you test it, right? Uh, so maybe I get uh, two different classes, one professor is very funny, the other professor is not very funny, and I see on average which class does better on a test. Uh, and that would be an empirical research article. Last but not least, I want to talk about the eight pages of a research paper. Uh, depending on what type of research paper you're doing, you might have uh, less of these, but in a general empirical study, this is what you'll be saying. So, of course, you have the cover page, which is the thing that says your name uh, and the school that you go to and the title of the article. Great. Uh, the abstract is a summary of the entire paper. So actually, even though it's a second page, you're most of the time going to add the abstract last because you need to get all this information in order to summarize all of it and put it into your abstract, right? Uh, so an abstract is great because let's say you're trying to do some uh, research and you find 20 different articles that might be related to what you're studying, right? You see the titles and it seems like they could be related, but you're not sure. 
if you weren't sure, you would have to read the entire article to make sure. But the abstract allows you to go, okay, uh, I see what they're studying, right? I know their hypothesis. I know their methods. I know the results that they got. I can read the entire article now and include it in my paper, right? Uh, or you read the abstract and then you go, oh, no, this has nothing to do with what I'm studying. Moving on, right? Because sometimes what happens is certain terms are used uh, in, like, different contexts. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, I study organizational pathology, uh, which is uh, basically looking at like organizations or businesses as a living creature and like understanding uh, like the lifespan of a company from beginning to end and the problems that might occur. There's also something called organizational pathology, which is mental illness uh, within uh, an organization. So what happens if your boss is a narcissist? What happens if uh, your employees aren't motivated enough, right? So if I'm trying to do uh, research for a paper, uh, I'm going to find things that are talking about organizational pathology and find other things that are talking about organizational pathology. Do they sound like the exact same word? It's because they are, right? Uh, so by reading the abstract, I can save myself a lot of time by not downloading and reading through articles that aren't related to what I'm talking about. The introduction is next. The introduction uh, does exactly what you think it's going to do. It introduces what you're talking about. So you're going to state your hypothesis. You're also usually going to do a brief literature review where you talk about other studies that have studied what you are researching, right? So if I'm doing uh, research on uh, the relationship between anxiety and test performance, right? I want to see what other studies have been done on anxiety and test performance. So I do a little summary. And I say, look at all these uh, studies that have been done. My study is going to be about this specific thing, right? Uh, and then I uh, can talk about uh, what I'm going to do, uh, which is my methods, which are the procedures that I'm going to use, right? I'm going to survey 150 students and ask them about uh, their general level of anxiety on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, and their current GPA. And I'm going to see if there's a relationship between GPA and test anxiety, right? Uh, so the method says how I'm going to do it. Uh, the methods are very uh, precise. They're kind of like a cookbook because you want to give a step-by-step -step of everything that you're going to do so that other people can come in later and criticize uh, your methods, right? So if you remember when we were talking about pseudosciences, I mentioned that it needs to be clear how you did your methods. That was the last point that we talked about in pseudoscience so that people can criticize them. Uh, if I just said that I surveyed a bunch of people, right, uh, it's hard to critically analyze how well I did my survey. If I said uh, I surveyed uh, 3,000 students among 30 different colleges nationwide, that's more precise, right? And then you can go, oh, they actually did a good job versus somebody who's like, I asked 20 of my best friends, uh, 20 best friends, uh, cool. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, um, 20 of my really good friends, uh, how anxious they are, right? Uh, less, less precise. And then we have our results, uh, which are basically just whatever, once you take all your data and run your statistics, reporting those statistics. So we found a significant relationship between anxiety and GPA. Uh, the more anxious people are, the better they do. Uh, uh, and then you have your discussion. Uh, and your discussion might be, uh, even though it might not make sense, uh, we hypothesize that uh, the increase in performance tied to uh, to um, uh, anxiety might be related to the fact that people who stress more are more likely to study or something like that. Uh, and so further uh, research will be needed. So the discussion kind of says, okay, this is what we found. This is why we think we found it. And this is what we're suggesting for future research, right? Uh, you might also say, 
these are some issues that came up during the study uh, where we realized that our survey was too short and we could have asked more questions. Uh, we didn't uh, account for differences in gender uh, or age. So future research should learn from us and also take these variables into account. Uh, then finally, uh, you have your references, which are just any uh, sources that you cited. So usually in your introduction, uh, you'll have listed several uh, articles in your literature review. Uh, so you want to state all of those in your references. And then the appendix uh, is just for diagrams and other things that you might want to include. So if you want to include a copy of your survey, if you want to include some additional charts, you put that in your appendix. And those are the eight parts of a research paper. Uh, that is chapters one and two. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, and yeah, we did it. First lecture.